Before we get our hands on the naive Bayes algorithm, let's first understand the foundation it's built on, Bayes theorem. Imagine a box filled with different shapes. Now, if we randomly pick one shape, what's the probability that it's a star? There are three stars here out of 10 total shapes. So the answer is simply 3 divided by 10. Similarly, if there are 4 green shapes in the box, then the probability of picking a green shape is 4 out of 10. So far, it's all straightforward. But now, let's flip the situation. Suppose a shape has already been picked and we are only told that it's green, nothing else. Now, what's the probability that the shape is a star given that it is green? This straight line after the star is called given that. The word given is crucial. It tells us we are only considering the green shapes now. Among those, how many are stars? If there are two green stars out of the four green shapes, then the probability becomes 2 divided by 4. And that in essence is Bayes theorem, a method to calculate the probability of an event when some related evidence is already known. Now let's derive the proper formula for Bayes theorem mathematically, keeping our star example in mind. The probability that the shape is a star given it's green is given by the probability that it is a star and green divided by the probability that it is green. This is the logic we have just seen. We can also reverse this and find the probability of the shape being green given that it's a star. This is the probability of green and star divided by the probability of being a star. Now, if we rearrange these equations, it turns out that the probability of being green and star or being star and green is equivalent. And from here, we can equate these two expressions and find the final expression for the probability of star given that it's green. Now, the denominator term here is the probability of the shape being green and the expanded form of that will look like this. This tells us that the probability of a shape being green is the sum of both when it is a green star and when it is not a star but the color is still green. Let's use the more familiar terms A and B in the equation as seen in textbooks. By the way, this little funny elbow type symbol is called NOT in mathematics. Now, this formula is not just valid for one event. We can have multiple events that might affect the probability. Let's take an example where we have three different events affecting the probability of event A. The expanded form will look something like this. Here, the first term is the probability of event X1 given that event A has occurred, multiplied by the probability of event X2 given that both X1 and A have occurred multiplied by the probability of x3 given that x1, x2 and a all have occurred together and finally all of that multiplied by the probability of a happening and the denominator term just like before is the total probability of these three events happening either given a has occurred or a has not occurred. This equation is the case where events x1, x2 and x3 are all influencing each other. Now. Naive Bayes is called a naive algorithm because it assumes that these events are independent of each other and are not affecting one another. That's the key assumption of this algorithm and that's why it's called naive. Now you might be thinking that in real life one event does influence another and you'd be absolutely right. But despite this it turns out that the naive Bayes algorithm works surprisingly well in practice even though it's naive. Now let's see how this all works. We have an example training dataset and we have a total of 8 days with 3 features called Outlook which can either be sunny, overcast or rainy. Then Humidity which can be high, normal or low. And Windy which can either be true or false. And we also have this final output called Play meaning whether the game was played or not. Think of any game, maybe badminton or tennis. Now, we are given a new input where the outlook is rainy, the humidity is high and windy is false. Based on these, we have to predict whether we should play or not. Now, how will we find this? We will use that naive base formula 
to calculate both the probability of the event happening and the probability of the event not happening and then we will compare the two whichever is higher would be our answer but wait these denominator terms are equal in both cases so why not remove the denominator term and save some computational time and let's call this new value a score rather than probabilities now we need to find these values in order to calculate the scores now let's see how to find this here the total number of yes in the data set is 5 out of 8 so the probability of events where the game has been played is 5 out of 8 now similarly there are 3 days where the game was not played so the probability will be 3 out of 8 next let's find out the probability of rain given that the game was played out of all 5 yes days only 2 were rainy Next, there is only one rainy day when the game was not played. And similarly, you can find all the other values. Try it out yourself. You should get these values. Now plug these values into the equation for scores. And you should get these results. Here, the score for no is higher. So that means the game should be played. Now, if you want to find the actual probability values, just normalize the scores by dividing each by the total of both. If you add these two normalized values, you will get 1, which makes perfect sense. Now let me teach you why we do not use this plain approach. Let's just change the windy feature of the day 1 to be true. Now after changing just this one value, the entire calculation will be altered. Now if you calculate the probability of false wind given no, it will be 0 because there was no day with no wind when the game was not played. So the probability becomes zero. The rest will remain as it is. Now, if we plug these values into the score equation, one of these scores will turn out to be zero, which means the probability of one event becomes completely zero. But this does not make any sense, right? And yes, that's exactly why we use something called Laplacian smoothing to deal with this zero probability problem. Let's see this formula. And do not despair. It just looks dangerous. It's super easy. Just stay with me. This is our normal probability of features F, like windy or humidity, given the output Y, yes or no. This hash type thing is just the, the term we were using as the numerator before. And this NY is the total number of yes or no outputs, just like before. Now what we have added new here is this plus one in the numerator and this vf in the denominator. This vf term is the total number of possible values of the particular feature we are dealing with. For example, humidity can have three values, high, normal, or low. So the value of vf will be three. And for the windy feature, it can either be true or false. So in that case, the value of vf will be two. Now, if you didn't understand the formula, don't worry, it will all get clear in just a moment. Now let's update these values using Laplacian smoothing. Here, we will not be updating the values of outputs because they are not collapsing to zero. Although it can be done here as well, but let's leave it. Now, the probability of rain given yes looks something like this, where we add one in the numerator and three in the denominator because rain belongs to the feature outlook, which can take three values. So the new term will be this. Simple, right? Next, the probability of rain given no can similarly be found. Now the probability of false given no will be like this, where we add one in the numerator and two in the denominator. Now this will not collapse to zero. And that's exactly why we use Laplacian smoothing. I hope this is clear by now. And similarly, compute all the other values. You should get these. Now, if we plug these in, the score will not collapse to zero. And in this case, the game should be played. Now, we are done with our typical binary classification using the naive Bayes algorithm. But naive Bayes is not limited to binary classification. It can also be used for multi-class classification. Take a look at this formula. It might look a bit scary at first, 
but it's simply a more compact and generalized form of what we have already seen. Here k is a particular class out of n different classes. Just like before, the algorithm computes probability scores for each class and picks the one with the highest score. Multi-class naive base is quite commonly used in natural language processing.